Boa noite a todos e sejam muito... Good evening, muito... everyone. Welcome to the third and last panel of the day, Brazil at Silicon Valley for this, one, for this Monday. The outskirts, how the Amazon is perceived by Brazilians. I am Eduardo Batagin. I am a student, a first year student of MBA at the Berkeley, at Berkeley University. I'm part of the operations team at Brazil at Silicon Valley. And I will be your host for the panel today. Considering the recent challenges uh, from, confronted by the Amazon region, such as uh, deforestation, fires, animal extinction, among others, we bring today two of the most brilliant minds to discuss this topic that is so pertinent for Brazil throughout this last century. However, uh, before we start, I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, which allowed us to host this event. They are Bank of America, BTG Pactual, DASA, Fundação Lehman, Global Ventures, Google for Startups, IBM, Institute DOR, Magalu, Pinheiro Neto Advogados, SoftBank, Stone, and Valor Capital. On behalf of the uh, Brazil at Silicon Valley team, I would like to thank our sponsors for the opportunity. To kick off our panel, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, I would like to welcome João Moreira Salles. He is an economist at the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. He is a documentary uh, cinematographer and producer of films such as Nelson Freire, Entre Atos, No Intenso Agora, and Santiago. He is also the founder of the Piauí magazine and chairperson of the Moreira Salles Institute. João, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And to moderate our panel, I would like to welcome Fernando Carmago with more than 25 years experience in the financial market. Fernanda has graduated in economy by the Catholic University of Sao Paulo. She was a partner at Gavi Gestão do Patrimonio and Vinci Partners. And today she is the founding partner of Ride Capital Wealth Management. Fernanda, thank you for your participation. I would like to remind everyone that at the end of our panel, we will have a session of questions and answers. So uh, send in your questions through the YouTube chat. And if you wish to listen to this uh, panel in another language, we have uh, the link for our English version. Fernanda, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Edu. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, brilliant minds, uh, well, that's just for Joel, not for me. So um, you already introduced uh, a bit the topic and João. So I would add by saying that not only that, he is also, uh, he roots for the Botafogo uh, team. We can never forget that. And also I would like to say that the Institute Serra Pideira is the first private institution. Uh, it's a grant making institute to uh, implement science in Brazil. So. This is a very important point also to highlight. We will talk today uh, uh, Ahabaldi. Uh, this is a uh, work of art that João did. Ahabaldi means outskirts. In terms of what we do not understand about the Amazon region, João, the idea before we actually start our presentation is to talk a little about you, your career, and uh, how you reached this interest and your choice of becoming a documentary and cinematographer because you study economy. So uh, we would like to know how this uh, decision was made. How did you navigate through your different professions? Well, it says that the economy department at the Catholic University is the best uh, cinematography school in Brazil. Lots of people left the economy and uh, Valtinho, my brother, who is the true uh, filmmaker in the, in the family. Uh, Valtinho is certainly an extraordinary filmmaker. He also did economy at the uh, university, I guess, Kaká So there's a long tradition. Uh, the Department of Economy at the Catholic University is a good graduation for cinematography. I didn't know what to do with my life. Brazil has this system which you have to choose very early what you want to do, what you want to do as a profession, the career you wish to follow. And uh, with you know, you're, when you're a teen, it's difficult. I guess the North American system is better because you you have a couple of years during your graduation, sort of you know start you know testing things, testing water, until you specialize, and then the actual specialization thing comes in the graduation part. And so I graduated in economy, but I 
but it was an extraordinary class, actually. I loved it. At the time, the greatest issue that Brazil was confronted with was hyperinflation. And if there was an economy department that had the ability and competency to deal with that issue, it would be in the Catholic University of uh, Rio, where they would teach Lara Rezende, Peste Arida, I was a monitor to Peste Arida, Pedro Malan, Arminio Fraga, he had just came back from his PhD. So it was a place where you know, Winston fritched also. So, you know, the first Cruzado plan and then the Real plan came from that. So it was fascinating to be there at that time. Every day we were able to discuss the greater Brazilian issues. And today a greater Brazilian issue is the Amazon, but we'll get to that. So intellectually, it was interesting to me. It was challenging and interesting. So I uh, also applied for a PhD in uh, the US. I was accepted. And in the interim, between the end of the uh, year of Brazil and going to the US, Walter, my brother, came back from Japan with 80 hours of material he had recorded there. And uh, he uh, things out of order. And he asked me if I wanted to use that six months to uh, prepare a series from about that material. And we did the series. It was launched on the Manchete Network, which no longer exists. It was successful. And then I didn't go to the US and I didn't do my PhD. It was a bit by chance, actually. It was a bit by chance. Nice, nice to hear that. So, well, good for us, good for us, I guess, because oh, for those, I'm not, I'm not sure if you watched uh, his work, it's one of the most uh, sensitive approaches we have. It's amazing how you have the ability of uh, putting yourself in another person's shoes and describe the scenes with different standpoints. So, thankfully, you uh, did this by chance or what have you. So we are here today to talk a little bit about this uh, time you spent in the Amazon region. When I met João, I guess it was a little bit before that, right? Yes. And we were uh, talking about this. I was wanting to help at the time the Amazon fund to see what we could do and bring to the table to try and help develop the fund and you were at the time going to the amazon to spend some time there so it'll be interesting for us to know how you made that decision uh, to go there why did you decide to do that and a little bit of uh, what was the impact of what you saw fernanda I like, like most people who participate in this conversation uh, these times, a Brazilian with the possibility of traveling, with the means of to travel, and that doesn't know uh, his country as well, but especially the Amazon region. So I finally realized that uh, 50 or almost 60, if I added all the time I spent in the region, it wouldn't be four days. It wouldn't add up for four days. I went there when I was a child. They took me to see the construction of the Trans-Amazon Highway with, uh, I remember, immense trees being cut down and uh, that being treated as a civilization advancement, you know, to cut down the forest and transform it in something else. It was a sign of modernity, which is a little bit what's still... Uh, passes through the mind of the Brazilian government. We have gone back 50 year, years in history due to this mindset of our government. And also Serra Pilera Branca, my wife and I, we created the Serra Pilera, this institute. So we visited some organizations in the Amazon that did the research. We wanted to understand how it worked. So uh, it was a total four days in my life. So I realized that this is shameful, actually, shameful. Uh, as a Brazilian with means knowing Brazil, wanting to better understand Brazil to, in a certain way, help. Uh, and to the extent I'm able to help the country, how could I have turned my back to something that is the greatest legacy, the greatest asset that Brazil has? And so I decided to do that professionally. I had the luck to do that professionally. I helped creating uh, the Piauí magazine. So I I proposed to our editor, Fernando Barros, to move to the Amazon for six months and uh, from Belém, which was my base, to get to know uh, Pará, the state of Pará, and just the state of Pará. The Amazon is too big and there is a, a life. You know, even Pará state needs a whole life. But for six months, 
I guess Pará is now better to understand than the whole um, on the Amazon. And Pará has one advantage. Pará is a type of a microcosmos of the Amazon. Pará has some of the forest blocks that is that are protected, that occupy the largest uh, area of protected uh, tropical rainforest. And the other hand, Pará is the frontier with the uh, with uh, the deforestation, with deserts that were created by mankind. And in Pará, you have the greatest projects, the great hydro plants, Belo Monte, Tucuruí, and you have things like uh, Jari, this delirious project of an American millionaire, and uh, the fascinating story, actually. And uh, you have a Vale do Rio Doce, you have Carajás project, you have a native population, you have a gold mining, you have a banditry, you have organized crime, you have the cities and you have the uh, urban chaos. So in the state of Pará, if you organize your trip well, you sort of are able to understand the glories and the horrors that we uh, commit in the Amazon and the glories of the bi biome itself and some extraordinary people who are there fighting, trying to protect the bioma, trying to protect the forest from, from uh, original population, from native population, the caboclos, the riverine population, and uh, those who have, you know, you know one of them, it's Beto Verissimo, and uh, Amazon, his amazing foundation. So this is, uh, so I rented a, an apartment in Belém and I would uh, travel for three days, five days, and then go back to Belém. Lots of things to do in Belém, lots of things happening in Belém. So it's um, a fascinating city actually, At the same, but at the same time, it's an equatorial city. You're in the midst, uh, you're just one degree uh, of, of, of Away from uh, Ecuador, you have uh, rain, you have humidity, you have uh, heat, but you have also the colors, the smell, the scents, the food, the flavors. So it's fascinating. So that's it. I, I, I was from August 2019 until December 2019. And then I had to go back to Rio because I, I caught some strange disease there. Then I came back to February to conclude my trip. So that was a, and the result of this, just to conclude, uh, was uh, seven uh, articles, long articles, published on the PLE in 2020. So, João, you uh, talk about one thing which was very shocking to me, because when you get there and you look out your window, what you see is a city like any other city, and the conversation also you had with people will sort of showing how they see the Amazon. Could you talk a little bit about that? This was uh, you know, something, now you, know, you had that insight. Okay, now I get it. Now, when I got to Belém at the time, there was a direct flight. There isn't a direct flight anymore from Rio to Belém. It was a flight that would get there you know, in the wee hours. I got there, what, 2 a.m. And I went straight to the apartment I had rented. And I woke up very early because I had a meeting, early meeting, around 6.30. And the first thing I see when I look out the window is a city and the sun, the sunrise. And it's inevitable, you know, then you realize that the city, Belém in this case, doesn't know anymore where they are. It is a city that is unprepared for where it is located. I would see people in the streets, you know, passing, walking, uh, close to the walls and to try to get some shade, you know, a little bit of shade, or maybe people walking with a paper or newspaper over their heads or maybe an umbrella to hide. Belém is a city of, uh, mang of uh, mango trees, but they exist but only in the historical center. And it's a small part of the city that has trees where you have urbanism, but it's the urbanism of uh, the last century, thanks to the money from the rubber industry. But then the city was eliminating its forests, its uh, urban forests, and its vegetation, its trees, its uh, landscape. So today, it's a city of uh, sky risers. It could be Baja da Tijuca, it could be the city of Cuiabá, it could be downtown LA, uh, worse, of course, uglier buildings, however. But it could be there, it could be anywhere, it could be in Stockholm, but it's... Uh, it's a one degree separated from the equator. So you see the buildings are all 
uh, of a, a dark glass. Everything has aluminum uh, window frames, everything with ACs. People who work, work and dress with the dark suits, especially the safety guards who are outside because it has become a violent place also. So they have to stand outside for half an hour, 40 minutes or they faint. So it's an absolute ignorance in terms of where you are. So this actually was my first impression of Belém. And I don't want to scare anyone. It's worthwhile going to Belém because there are glorious things in Belém, but there's this uh, wild urbanism that is part, of course, of Brazilian urbanism is even worse there because you are in the warmest place on the planet. And this feeling that we have occupied a bioma without understanding the bioma, without trying to understand this bioma, in a uninterested manner, in a not very curious manner, will be expanded through everywhere you go in Pará. If you want me to tell the story, this is a story that I heard many times. It's a, a sentence that I've heard many times of the Brazilians who were taken there by the military in the 60s and 70s. They would make money to go to the forest, to deforestate, to do deforestation and to implement their machineries. And these people, some made it there, others didn't, and others didn't wait enough. So when you talk, when you talk to them, they're very proud of the adventure of uh, having opened that region, of having opened, you know, destruct, destroy the forest and build something else. And this is what was demanded from them. It's I'm not judging these people. They were taken there to do that, to do that, to fulfill that specific mission, because the forest would be worthless. The forest is uh, useless. It, it does not serve the system. It does not accumulate capital. So you just tear it down so that you can build something else in place, so that capital can uh, the work. And people would say this. In many places, but I heard the same sentence. They said, when I got here, there was nothing. It was a desert. Or when I, I mean, when, I, when they say, when I got here, there was nothing, it seems that it, that, that bioma that has and hosts 20% of the world's biodiversity, which is the most complete uh, biodiverse system in the world and probably in the universe is nothing to them. It's, so it has to be replaced for what is something. So what is something in this case? It is a landscape that these people brought in their minds when they got there. So when people, uh, you know, get rich, make it there, they do the America and the Amazon, they are kind, they're good hosts, they invite you to visit their homes. These are uh, beautiful homes and farms and you eat a uh, barbecue in the balconies and the landscape you see is not no longer a forest. There's no longer a forest. There's no longer the Amazon. What they have there are, uh, you know, agricultural lands, pastures. If they come from the south, they would develop their own uh, area from the south. If he comes from inland Sao Paulo, another landscape I know well, what you have from their balcony is inland, land, inland Sao Paulo landscape. And the forest never had a chance because it was never understood. It was never studied. There was no curiosity regarding the forest. So the Amazon was always seen as something that needed to be transformed in something else into something else. And it starts with a magnificent mistake in its interpretation. It's called Amazon because a monk, uh, Benedictine, uh, Benedictine Frei Gaspar de Carvajal, who wrote, writes the first report in terms of crossing the Amazon, the Amazon River, that is, uh, from where it is born, uh, born until uh, its uh, opening to the sea, he writes this, and in Pará, he looks at the riverside, and he, he sees the warriors, the women warriors, Amazons, the women warriors, and he thinks that they are the Amazons that are seen in Otello. So they, he was conditioned to see in the Amazon what his experience, his cultural experience, that his cognitive uh, mind would allow him to see. But the force itself, what it is, is radically different from everything that he could ever imagine coming from Europe. And he had never seen that. 
and the Amazon is called Amazon because of misinterpretation, which is very symptomatic because it's what we do with the Amazon till today. And even tell the story that they they go hungry. Yes, they go hungry. They go hungry. There are some that actually die out of hunger because this, then in this expedition, some will actually die from hunger because how would they uh, have food? They would uh, create certain uh, native population. They would come close to uh, native uh, uh, livings. There would be a violence, a war, and if they prevailed, they would kill and they would bring us whatever they had in terms of food and they would gain another maybe one week of uh, food but then the uh, natives started winning so they had no way to uh food and they, they couldn't see food again you're in a, a biodiverse ecosystem in the planet where everything can become a food if you know how what you're looking for and they wouldn't see anything it's a, it was like to them a desert and this is a bit what we have in terms of the record of our forest most of those travelers who went there and will treat a forest as if it were a dangerous place a hostile environment a place where you should be afraid it's a place of death therefore a place that has to be fought against and possibly eliminated to be replaced by something that can be domesticated and that you are familiar with in the chapters you sort of you know you tell the story of how Brazilians were occupying the Amazon and how many mistakes and misunderstandings happened in, throughout the way it's interesting because you presented this side but you also presented some other examples of what actually worked of those who stayed there and actually worked yeah there are many examples of things that did work but they are not the mainstream so to speak they are subsistence. They are the exception that we hope my, may one day will become mainstream. So there are many examples from the native population, of course, who understand the forest and uh, who were able to manipulate the forest. The forest, and this is a great discussion of a contemporary uh, archaeology. There are great areas of the forest that uh, can be seen by us as the cultural landscapes, as the landscapes that were constructed. It's not a natural forest, it's an anthropogenic. There is human uh, interference, but it is a human interference to maintain the forest diverse, to keep it alive, for you to have your own uh, construction, your own plants and not attack. Because if you have monoculture, for instance, the uh, forest will send its troops in to destroy because there's so much life. There's maybe one life that's not going to like you and they will prevail. If you maintain biodiversity, everything seems to be in balance. And the native population did how to do that. In the 20th century, there is a wonderful experience in Pará in a municipality called Tome Asu. It's a Japanese colony. And, and there's an agricultural engineer who came to Pará right after the Second World War with his country destroyed without speaking one word of Portuguese. He came, he was called Sakagushi, and he came and he did what everything one did. He planted uh, uh, cacao, uh, he didn't work, then he plant, planted rubber, didn't work because there were the pests. And then he one day decided to stop and think about what he was doing. And this is a beautiful story. He uh, took a coastal navigation, you know, this uh, ship that will go stop everywhere. He wanted to go all the way to Belém from Tomiasu, it's a two, three days uh, trip. And then one of the stops, he went down to stretch out his legs. And he was walking around and he stopped in front of a, a river in population, a modest home. Or a, a, and he was sitting there eating a fruit, this man. And he looked at this man and this man looked at him and they looked at each other. And it was sort of that weird silence. Something was happening. No one knew exactly what was going on. So then with a very poor uh, broken Portuguese, he said, who planted this tree, the fruit that the guy was eating? Uh, let's say it's a mango, I don't know. And, and, the, and the guy said, well, he said it was uh, the father. And he said, 
And the, yeah, that, well, how about that one? It would be papaya. Well, that was my grandfather. And how about that other one, acai? He said, oh, well, that was my great grandfather. And this one here, Pitanga, was, it was me. And this one here, this uh, Puchi was my father and this my uncle. So he realized, the Sakaguchi realized that the only way for uh, you to prosper in the Amazon by planting is respecting the uh, diversity of the forest. This was an empiric knowledge of those who lived there. So he went back to his colony, to his village. He brought together all the Japanese he had come with him and said, listen, we're doing everything wrong here. We have to mix and match. The salvation is to mix and match everything. So the idea here is not to plant one single product, but because a pest will come, it will attack one species or the other, but they're not specialized in the other one. So we can survive with the other one. And even more so, the species that will attack one kind of uh, culture probably will have an adversary. And this adversary, if biodiversity is kept and respected, will be somewhere around. So you will have a balance in this business. So he took some time to convince his colony and his colleagues, uh, Japanese colleagues, that it would be possible to plant that way. He, They convinced them because Sakaguchi started doing this in his culture, in his land, and he started benefiting and uh, producing a lot. And today, I guess there's six or 7,000 families that live from these agro uh, forest businesses and it was invented by Sakaguchi and it's beautiful and I went into one of these forests and these are forest dash uh, plantations with the son of Mr. Sakaguchi and I am a lay person in terms of that to me that was a forest it wasn't a plantation a culture and I asked uh, Sakaguchi the son the father was already dead and said Sakaguchi where is your plantation he would laugh and say that's all around you I said but they where and then he would point to the trees here and there everything everything every every everything was productive there in different moments and different times and uh and everyone there will have like a middle class life. They all have a decent life. Children going to the university and the forest is alive and the animals are alive and you can hear all the sounds and it rains. So and it's decent. It's uh, so you can do different, but you need to be available. You have to have what Sakaguchi had, the will of looking to the forest and uh, understanding that you cannot understand the forest and you cannot insist in your mistakes. And then to try and understand where is the virtue of things, to look at it and have the understanding of things. That's it. He said he worked with the forest and not against it. Yes, and not against it. And, uh, and, I, and I will say more. You know, that, you know there may be people saying, well, he's these being naive. Of course, you can't feed the world by doing that. And uh, you don't have, you know, a silver bullet. You don't have one single solution. You have a number of solutions. But the solution that we adopt in the Amazon and continue to adopt since the 60s, this certainly is not a bullet for anything. This is a poison bullet because the Amazon have lost already 20% of its forest coverage. The Amazon in the 70s, only 5%, 0.5%, less than 1% uh, was uh, cut down. Today is 20%. The destruction of the Amazon will happen in uh, our lives. It's not a 500 years, it's a 50 year story. So we are responsible for that. We who are now living and walking are responsible for the destruction of the Amazon and the risk that this will imply not only to us, but in mankind in general and for living beings. But what I want to say is that you destroyed 20% of the forest and you would say, well, okay, we destroyed 20% of the forest. However, the Amazon, prospered and uh today the amazon is the silicon valley of agriculture it's there that's a mistake no the amazon it was impoverished in terms of brazil this occupation process it did not uh, does not produce income wealth or prosperity it is a concentration of wealth 
criminality, money in the hands of very few people, most of them criminals, most of them dishonest, uh, especially now. Uh, deforestation at this moment is a criminal uh, deforestation. It is not for production and, uh, and also catastrophe, environmental catastrophe, beginning with Brazil. So this is a model that is totally wrong. And we have been betting all our chips on that, especially uh, since uh, Bolsonaro took office and all the people who surround him. João, you were... João, you've already talked about this, but you mentioned Robert Schneider's uh, study, the occupation and the consequences that you're talking about now. And all this made this part of Brazil become poorer. But then you also talk uh, about what we want. Uh, you talk about the biochemical teacher of Stanford that he says if you could attack one of the problems of climate change, he would uh, point towards the cows. And then he explains why. So I think it would be interesting to talk about this because people are talking a lot about um, agri-tech. Yeah, this is an example of uh, something that worked out very well in California. It, it's a known story. So he was a guy that um, used to deal with the cli climate. And one day with a colleague, he said, ah, if we could um, confront the most central problem of the climate issue, what would we do? So he gave those answers, deforestation, fossil fuels. He said, no, no, it's the cows. Well, why the cows? Well, because of the the cattle rearing, we know that it's very inefficient. The meat that we eat normally is a result of deforestation. And then you have all the biochemical processes of the flatulence and the the cows that produce, if I'm not mistaken, if the if cattle would be the third issuer of, of gases, third or four country in issuing gases. So to attack the meat problem is to attack the most central problem of global warming. And so he created, I think the name is a possible burger. This was create, generated in 2011 and he launched the first hamburger in 2016. The hamburger is a technological cam hamburger. It's made in a lab, made just with, uh, I've never eaten one because we don't have it in Brazil, but it gives you the apparent sensation in a blind test. A, a large part of a lot, uh, the people cannot distinguish between the impossible burger and um, a meat hamburger. And I, Brought this data, the company that was created, yeah, in 2011, the first Hamburg in 2016, it was evaluated in $4 million in 2020, and it was worth half of this in 2019. And it's a small, small company in relation to the other one that was born in California, which is called Beyond Meat. So it's to substitute animal protein giving you the sensation that you're consuming animal protein so when this article was published it was worth seven million dollars so this made it two times smaller than brf which is the fusion of saji and pirjigam beyond meat is worth four marfrigis so this is one experience of food tech. There are many others. New York Times published a, a while ago a long article about hydroponic. These are the urban farms that don't need land, and they are going to supply all the vegetables and 
fruits that a large urban center needs without occupying the land, using very little water. So there's a revolution in the agriculture world, and Brazil is totally at the side, on the margin. The Brazil is that the manufacturers of diligence is that they didn't find out that they were in the diligence uh, line and they were in transport and they insti they uh, insisted on this and they did not invest in transport so the cattle raisers they don't understand that they are in the food industry they think they're in the soy and cattle industry if cattle I'm going to read something not to make a mistake. The report for 2019 of the Kearney Global Consulting says that up to 2040, that means the day after tomorrow, 60% of the meat consumed in the world will not come from animals. So what are you going to do with the Amazon? What are you going to do with that land that's been destroyed to put six seven thin cows the cattle they have this term which is the how many cows you have per hectare it's less than one per hectare that's a, a hectare is a football field so it's less than one so in the states it's six seven eight so you devastate the soil the soil is extremely poor the forest needs the forest to feed itself as the system which is very complex and it retrofeeds itself so or if you degrade the forest it is not feasible as a system and what's left is the increasing uh, poverty of the landscape which ends up in what i saw at the side of a highway between Santarini and Taitaitu, but one hand on one side of a forest, a protected forest, and on the other hand, a on the other side, a desert where nothing grows. That's what I wanted to ask you. And that's why it's good to go there. You see, you have to see. Well, you said that you drove five hours on the left side, you only had a desert. It, it's a desert. It's a desert you you go from for half an hour you see a, a poor little house uh, a place that used to have cattle cattle with no roof it's a sensation that people have abandoned they've given up because that's how the amazon is occupied you deforest then you live from the nutrients that the forest deposited on the soil then you explore the soil for six or seven years it becomes too as as uh, arid as a desert anywhere in the world and then you advance again into the forest more and more into the forest leaving Back a legacy of, of our children and uh, grandchildren, arid desert that cannot provide the ecosystem services that the forest provides when it's standing up and destroying the capacity of Brazil to be the only thing that Brazil has been able to do, which is a competent com country in agriculture. Competent, not extraordinary. For you to have an idea, Costa Rica produces per hectare 25 m times more animal protein than Brazil. We're not, not even going to talk about the US because we lose 41 or 51. They're African countries that are uh, m more productive than cattle raising in the Amazon. Why? Because it's extensive cattle raising that uses the natural capital until it's exhausted and continues advancing into the forest and nowadays not even that in the last 10 or 15 years the destruction of the amazon today is something that is to appropriate themselves of of, of uh, land that belongs to all of us brazil so it's it's really speculating it's militias it's what happens here in rio in Rio das Pedras, 
and in areas where the Bolsonaro family works or in the Amazon, the business model is the same. You occupy, you knock the forest down, then you put there one or two uh, uh, cows that are very miserable and very unhappy, just to say that you're doing something. They live badly, they die even worse. But that tells you that you occupied the land and then you have laws that are running through Congress right now, laws that represent uh, uh, going back 40 or five years. And, um, and this is going to actually reward the people that have stolen our land. So we are going on the wrong direction of the world and uh, we could position ourselves as we have done in the past as a responsible environmental country and in a period of 10 years due to technology research and good policies reduced 80 percent of the deforestation in the amazon and grew 87 percent the agriculture export of the Amazon reason proving a plus B that there's no contradiction in pro uh, protecting the forest and um, the two things go parallel to each other. And then this uh, North American economist, Bob uh, Schneider, who wrote and he explains how the Amazon is occupied by the Brazilians. But the essential idea is that you don't have to enrich the land because you know that it's infinite. So no one prohibits you from advancing since you're not prohibited or forbidden for knocking down this forest. You can be very inefficient because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for you to be efficient, to enrich in the soil costs a lot. So just advance, occupy. Iberma is not going to fine you, Salis won't, uh, Isemibi won't register any crime, the public prosecutors don't have any more capacity. So your incentive, your economical incentive is to be the most inefficient possible because you earn more money being inefficient because you don't have the cost of the land and the land can be abandoned because you know that further forward you can knock down another parcel of land and the cost of this is the cost of the deserts that we see. You already have in the Amazon 24 million kilometers of abandoned land. This is a, a Kuwait. It's a whole country of forests that were knocked down for nothing because they were abandoned. There's no one there. There's there are no, no proprietors. Once when Aberkem came to Brazil, who's a big specialist, uh, he said, you were burning Mona Lisa. He was shocked. You, you're burning the biggest treasure of humanity. And one thing that you said and that uh, sort of touched my heart is that you said we have to generate connections. Since Brazilians have never had a connection, it's fundamental and it can't be just economical. It has to be cultural. So talk a little bit about this because I think this is very important. I think, well, we don't have this connection. The destruction will continue. This idea that there's nothing here, this idea is very powerful. It means that the forest hasn't occupied the imagination it doesn't it's not important it's not part of your of your assets as a brazilian and it's not part of us we who didn't occupy the amazon we haven't made the effort to integrate the amazon to our citizen um, asset and so it it makes it easier to destroy because it's not invested in affection curiosity or love so a symbolic work of noticing that what can define us as a relevant country for the 21st century is to be a country that was able to preserve the richest forest in the world and 60% of this forest is within our boundaries. 
And if the world has nine systems, this is a classical and fundamental study, the world has nine systems that allow life to exist. The oceans, the atmosphere, so the nine. Of these nine, the Amazon is on the conversion of th conversion of three biodiversity, carbon capture. Brazil is the uh, the inorganic materials the the largest country that has carbon stocked. If you if you include what's in the soil, Russia. So biodiversity, carbon and uh, fresh waters. So rivers, the Amazon forest produces 20% of the water of the planet. Only one country in the world has a bioma that alone is responsible for three of the nine systems that allow life to exist on the planet. So there are few countries that are more important than Brazil, and there are few countries that are able to perpetrate such a grave crime as Brazil, because if you destroy the Amazon, meow, life will continue, but not this one and not with us. So we have a civilization duty. Are we going to allow this to happen? Because this bill is going to be ours. It's not going to be anyone else's. So first of all, we have to understand this. In the second place, we have to incorporate the forest in our moral consciousness, in our cultural imagination. And we also have to be amazed by it, because once you see the forest in its glory and its splendor, you you don't remain the same. That is amazingly powerful. What happens there, the complexity, the mystery, the richness, the generosity in sense of allowing us to be here and breathing and eating 6% of the Brazilian agriculture is irrigated. The rest depends on rain and rains will, will end. IPCC's report says that who's going to pay for this bill starts with Brazil and then it goes through South America and the world if the Amazon goes away. But to come back, the Amazon is beautiful and if it's preserved, what one can do with the forest is in the imagination each one of you you there's a brazil project that goes through the amazon what project is this it is to transform brazil in the world center a reference center of low carbon agriculture to make brazil a place of new materials is extracted from nature pneumatic engineering based on the molecules that cure uh, new legal marks to to get to pay the population that preserves all this all this could be the amazon and the amazon can be the place where we express ourselves in a competent glorious and wonderful way it's what we call bioeconomy without really knowing what it's all about this passes by technology by science a state project, uh, an illuminated government, certainly not the one that we have now that moves backward, is it worse than the military, worse than the military dictatorship in the sense that the military dictatorship, as I've written somewhere, was against the democracy, but wasn't against reason and science. They had projects of modernizing the country Bolsonaro doesn't have. His project is to regression, destruction. Bolsonaro is a person who decides what books are going to be distributed by the Ministry of Education to our school. Uh, this person is a, is a creationist. It's pre-Darwin. 
it's pre-Galileo also because he has no scientific evidence. Evidence doesn't count. So the first task is, ta task is to substitute this government the quickest possible and make the Amazon the destination of Brazil. It's just uh, for us to go to the questions when, when you finish. Now, if you imagine that the climate emergencies are going to be in the center of the world debate from now on, uh, the, the importance that Brazil can have if we preserve the forest and the value chains, the, the, the forest has to be protected even if it's if it's not worth anything. It doesn't have to be useful. What is there have the right to be there. But beyond this, it is an extraordinary economical possibility for Brazil. So it's up to the new generations to, gen to extract these value chains with the forest standing up. And if Brazil does that, Brazil will sit with the big ones saying, look, we, we did our mission. We want to be uh, we want to be rewarded for this, and we hope that you understand that we did this, what we did for the planet. We are at the cusp of being a wonderful or a terrible country. Well, I hope that the people that are there studying inspire themselves and that we are able to attract young people to create this journey. I'm going to let you... Um, talk about uh, no I'll go into the questions and answers so the thank you to to share so much information not only of about our country but uh, sharing this conversation with the world uh, the topic is marvelous and but we must move to the question so starting this question and answer those who are watching us you can send your question through the YouTube chat. There's still time. So the first question is a cool question. It's Julia Mazzali. João, the Amazon forest has a dimension that can make its protection difficult. What are the main leverages that the federal government can have to decrease the illegal exploitation of the forest? Julia, Julia let me tell you something. This response has been given. We know how to do this. We developed competency in relation to this. Brazil has the best monitoring uh, tropical forest system in the world. It's a reference for the world. Some Brazilian researchers that work with uh, remote censoring. So if we wanted to end the deforestation in Amazon in two or three years, we know how to do it. The problem is that today the destruction of the forest is a government policy. It's not a collateral effect. It's not, um, it's not something that happens in spite of the effort of the government. The efforts of the government are in this direction. The forest occupies, if it doesn't have an important place in our imagination, it has a very important place in their imagination. It's the place of the NGOs, for of the leftists, for some bizarre reason. They think that the forest is linked to leftist movements, to the science of the climate, to indigenous people. Therefore, it's a proxy of everything that should be fought. I have no doubt that this government celebrates Sim. the deforestation eu, eu rates. So I would have to give you a very long and drawn out response. Salve but there's an article that I wrote. I think it's the fourth or fifth that é o it's not the last one. What is the last one? And the title is What We Want. This tells step by step what we've done from 2004 to 2012 13 to get this extraordinary result of decreasing 80% of deforestation in the Amazon. We know how to do it. We have the technology. Cool. The next uh, question comes without a name, but how to start in children this awareness of the environment and how to strengthen this knowledge in the future? That's an excellent question. 
I one of the articles that I wrote is in, in a town called Parago Minas. Parago Minas is interesting because it used to be called Parago Balas, which is bullets. It's in Paris where devastation was most severe, and there was a virtuous process there, and there was a social pact uh, by the for the reduction of. Uh, the deforestation it's a model city today the the municipality introduced environmental education right from the start and what's interesting is that the environmental education is not a, a subject it's transversal you learn you talk about it in math you talk about it in portuguese history geography chemistry physics it goes through all the topics and with no doubt this would be a way reduce the uh, sorry to, to do it but as Paragominas did in a transversal way and those who ask that question I, I have a lot of hope about the young people that are here because these people understand that their future is in risk they really understand this concretely life in 2014 2050 if we continue as we are now it's going to be much worse than in 2020 2021 much more illness many more social conflicts uh, more deserts more poverty more suffering and we are doing we're responsible for this and especially brazil with the amazon so i believe that the generations that are coming are generations that are more aware of the need of being responsible in relation to the environment now perhaps they'll arrive too late because we have to take decisions that will allow their lives to be better than ours well who asked this question was lucila and i think the last question is marcelo salazar well your availability of diving into the Amazon is wonderful. Are you going back there? What are your next projects in the Amazon? I want to go back because Marcelo Salazar wants to convince me that the Xingu River is more beautiful than the Tapajós River. So I want to go back to be convinced because the Tapajós is act so beautiful, but Xingu is also very impressive. I want to continue to dedicate myself to the Amazon. I think it's something when you start, he actually moved there. He's from Sao Paulo and um, he works in, he lives in Altamira. I want to continue. There is a new topic that fascinates me, which is what I said and what I talked about is the forest as cultural production of the indigenous people. There are parts of the forest that are not pristine they're not natural forests they're cultural forests this is something that was built we imagine that civilization is only period pyramids and well but civilization can be forests as well and our people are original people they left us ruins that we're unable to see because they're they're live it's a legacy it's an organic botanical legacy and it's live and I think this idea changes everything and I want to understand this better. That's why I want to go back and to get to know Xingu better. Okay, Marcelo. Cool. Well, to end, there's another question that doesn't have a name. How we, normal people with different activities, no matter what our profession is, how can we help uh, to preserve the Amazon forest and what should, what could we do? whatever you think is in your reach read try to learn if there's uh, any manifestation pro amazon go out go to the streets brazil is not only made of destruction our image is terrible in the world so there are so many pro there are a lot of protests defending the amazon outside brazil more than in brazil the last uh, manifestations against Bolsonaro, I saw a lot of messages of the Amazon and those who can travel in the holidays that are thinking of, I don't know, going out of Brazil, 
substitute one trip to Miami or Cancun or wherever you want and go to Alter do Chão, go to Orishimina, go to Xingu. Marcelo Xingu, try to get to know it. And, and you, you don't have to spend six months, spend, spend a week, spend five days. You will not come back the same person and you'll come back with a sensation that what we're doing there is a crime, a sin against the country. It's a heresy. It's deeply that produces uh, the, uh, a very bad feeling in the sensation of being Brazilian. And then I think what you can do will come naturally. Not everyone has to go there and spend five months. Not everyone has to dedicate themselves to the Amazon full time. But purchase things that are made there. Marcelo, for example, he works with local producers that live off the forest. Try and see where these products are. Purchase them. Stimulate the value chains that benefit people that keep the forest standing. That is already a wonderful way of helping and getting to know the Amazon. There's nothing more beautiful. And I know the world. There's nothing more beautiful. Very good. Well, João, Fernanda, we have now reached the end of our first day of event of Brazil Silicon Valley. Once more, I'd like to thank you for your participation and all the public that has listened to us. I would also like to thank our sponsors once more who allowed for this event to happen and say that we'll be back tomorrow at five o'clock in Brazil, one o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast of the US with McKinsey's presentation and the panel platforms and the future of e-commerce with Harley Finkelstein, president of the Shopify and Lia Matos, direct strategic director. So we'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here.